Hi there, and welcome back to week four of Hearthstone Global Games with me once again for the fifth of six matches today. Is Sotto. How's it going, man? Thankfully, I haven't been here for five of them. I've enjoyed enormously the ones that I've done, but breaks are important too. And we are back again for match number five. The last one was an absolute marathon. And honestly, the way this meta is going, these series do tend to be on the long side. There's a lot of powerful control decks around in the format. Is this finally, are we finally seeing the fabled control meta of yore, Lorinda? Everybody has wished for since the dawn of time. It, it never happens. The aggro decks will be back. They always are. They always are. Looking forward to this one. It's going to be Greece and Portugal, two of the biggest European communities in terms of Hearthstone action, and both of them a bit confident. Just a little bit, yeah. Portugal definitely have some some characters on there, but I think it's primarily been uh, Greece in the form of uh, Lagabals, who was certainly one of the most animated characters that we've ever seen at HCT. Um, just but even in the preliminaries as they were back then, he was one of the most animated players on webcam. So, so uh, happy and jubilant celebrating when he won. Um, but also, you know, when we got a chance to talk to him, interview him, hang out with him at the HCT event that he qualified for, he's a very uh, loud, proud and confident man. Yeah, you say he's proud. He has been trying more than anybody that I know to organize the community in, yes. in his country and he has gathered them together. He was keen to let me know in February that 13 Greek players were in the top 100 of the ladder. Not bad going. Um, and he's also given me some information for this. Basically, they've been allowed to, to play test in a cafe in a name I'm going to butcher, but I'd rather try and get it out there than not say it at all. In it. Thessaloniki has a cafe that lets the team practice in there, uh, the four team members, and also uh, Fino, Phenomeno. Mm -hmm. He has been a instrumental in helping them set up their lineups and their decks. And Portugal have had help from their other teammates like, outside of the team as well, like Zuka. The, you, were feeling, you were trying to work out who it was earlier who made the priest deck, the silence priest deck. He got to number two legend with that a couple of weeks ago. Nice. He, he's one of the guys credited for that. He's been helping out with Priest. So both these teams getting players from outside of their team to help them in the playtesting. And look at this. Warlock pairings again going with two potential power decks. We talked about the reasoning behind this extensively, but if you haven't been following throughout, Warlock with Paladin, basically the story here is that no one really wants to play Warlock. So <laughs> Warlock with Paladin is just saying, hey, Paladin's strong, it's flexible, it's uh, unpredictable enough so no one really knows what to mulligan for. Let's just pair that, we'll play Paladin 100% of the time. Warrior is the other choice because when you play it with Warrior, you still have a very polarized 50-50 that your opponents have to try and get through. They know you're playing the Warrior, but they don't know whether it's Pirates or whether it's Quest, and those demand very different matchups from your picks. However, those two cancel each other out completely because there's no real 50-50 on either right. side. It's just going to be Paladin versus Warrior and that's more often than not. This week, eventually somebody's going to bring a Warlock deck that works really well with whichever thing they, they think isn't going to be played, and suddenly it's going to be... It might not be a good ladder deck. It would just be a deck that's built for one week, one right. week only. We're going to beat your XYZ. But no surprise to anybody at all here. It's going to be Random Warrior deck versus probably a mid-range Paladin deck. Yes, indeed. And I mentioned this in the last series as well, that you know there are some countries that are taking this incredibly seriously. Of course, everyone's motivated, everyone wants to do well, but I look at, for example, Tyler is extremely enthusiastic right. about this tournament for the Netherlands. Maybe it's worth one of those players that's really worth looking to put the time in. Just play Warlock for a week. Test literally everything and just find yourself a deck that can really just come into this and do some sort of job. Yeah, and I think somebody will end up doing that. I think this is a format that if you can, you only have to do it once, and then everybody's terrified of you for all of the other weeks of the tournament. Yeah. I um, mean, we, we saw uh, Murloc Paladin in Trinity Series. We saw Tempo Mage then come in later. These were decks that were not being played early on, that were considered weak, that found their spot in a slightly strange tournament format. Of course, dramatically different format here in HGG, but it's the same sort of thing. There is a meta to be solved, and some thinking outside of the box might just get you over the line on the last few weeks. And I don't think we're anywhere near solving this meta yet. We've had a change every single week I've been here, every single week I've watched. There has been something different turn up. Last week we were just starting to see the start of the mage deck appearing. This week it's normal. Yes. Suddenly, seven days later, we've just normalized the fact you're allowed to discover a million things in a game. Yeah, that's just the mage that people play now, unless your name is George C, apparently. But going into this game now, it's going to be what looks to be a slightly <laughs> slower variant since the uh, curator is present as one of uh, Lacobas' teammate. 
gets him all set and ready to go. Quick massage, slap to the vase to wake him up a bit. Headset rocking and ready, like a boss is ready to play some Hearthstone. Dr. Boom, on the other hand, looking a bit more low-key down at the bottom there with the Quest Warrior lined up. I don't know about you, but I struggle to take bosses serious face seriously. Even there, he's like, set, yeah, I'm ready to go. He's, he's just too funny for me. <laughs> I do like, I love the, the things that you gave us on, you know, how proud he is of the Greek community, because I can definitely echo that when I got to talk to him at HCT. One of the first things that he really wanted to talk about was the work that he did with the community. Right. He showed me an app that he'd uh, got developed that the Greek community could use to share news and deck lists, etc. And so he is definitely a big community figure for the Greek Hearthstone players and is very, very quite rightly proud of that fact, both proud of the work that he's done and proud of the work that the Greek community have done for themselves to rally around and yeah, yeah I sent him a, a question basically say could you answer this for me and I have enough material from his answer to go for three or four weeks nice which is cool we now present a reading from <laughs> Neil Bond's book of facts the book of facts hey my fact book's good with those paper clips you announced yesterday we're fine by the holy light, says like a boss, and yep, slower variation confirmed. Sometimes Curator is in the more aggressive builds, just to uh, make sure you don't run out of gas in the late game. It becomes a little bit awkward as to which dragon you want to play in that position, because uh, Primordial Drake, not really the kind of synergy you want to be going for no. if you're pushing, but it's still a good engine card to keep you going if you don't hit uh, any of the big power cards later on. But the equality more or less confirms that this is a slower build, as well as the Hungry Crab, which is at least indicating that you are looking to react to things that your opponent is doing with this deck. Yeah, I think it's important that you said the Hungry Crab as well there, like taking the two together, because yesterday Rave and I were casting and the equality was actually in a fairly aggressive build. Uh, it turns out that you can build this deck how you want as long as it all has synergy going on. But yeah, the, the two together do do just indicate that it should be slower. That was the game where the crab was played, right? And they had a massive debate about whether to shadow step it or not right. back to the hand and then got punished by there the There is no way afterwards. this can be killed, right. equality. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Because yeah. there's a tide call in play, you just don't expect it ever to. Yes. Ah, my opponent's famous tide caller equality deck. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That worked out well. Okay. Portugal here. It's the same old, same old with the warrior. Like, just trying to get enough taunts early enough, not just to get the quest done, but to not die. It's kind of important. Side effect of playing a lot of taunts. Dirty Rat is uh, fairly amusing here for Portugal, or at least it will be for Lycabals, because it actually gets him a 1-2 on the board that he has no real way of playing right now. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, he would actually gain a benefit. If he ate a small enough Murloc, then, you know, plus 2, plus 2 with the, uh, the, the the crab effect would actually, you know, if he just ate a hero power Murloc, for example, he's actually gaining an Spider advantage. Spider tank yeah. for but, beginners. But Dirty Rat would pull it out for free and get himself a 1-2 on the board, but of course the big win would be if the rat just pulled War Leader out for free on the next turn. Yeah, especially as Boss is likely to draw into something he can play next turn, probably two-thirds of the time. Something like that, there'll be enough of those cards in there. Like a boss is such a troll. <laughs> Stonehill Defender, more indicators of a slower build for uh, for like a boss, but still, if he's uh, able to keep snowballing this aggressive start, then Stonehill actually functions as a, a decent card to give you what can be turned into an aggressive push with, say, Sunkeeper Tarim on turn six, just turning a small Murloc board into a real aggressive uh, force, trading through an Ali Armor Smith or a Diehorn Hatchling just with one minion and then keep on pushing. Yeah, one thing that they're going to have to think about here with that in mind is whether they want their first push to be now with the War Leader and just go at it, or whether to keep the War Leader until much, much later and have a massive second push with Hero Power, with uh, Megasaur and, and those cards, and just save it all for one massive attack. But this is massive enough in Bolster's mind. He's just going to start pushing 10 a turn and tell you to deal with that. Execute just very, very awkward here due to the new uh, or new ish inflated uh, execute cost. Three mana uh, Ravaging Ghoul could be used with uh, coin execute. But with the increased cost of two, of course, that's not possible even with the coin. Right, so it's an actual huge predicament here. Uh, how do you deal with this board state? It just, it just can't be done, right? You've like, got to do it over two turns. It? Exactly. Right. Just go, go now to at least put something on the board to soak up some damage, and then at least you're injuring the War Leader for Execute next turn, potentially. It's a, it's a miserable proceeding, though. 
Yeah, the numbers just not adding up mana wise at all. It's only turn three. It feels like turn six or seven with that board that's bearing down on them. Actually, kind of creative and maybe a little bit too cute, but you could uh, hero power and shield slam the war leader for two this turn. And then next turn, you have uh, Ravaging Ghoul to remove the war leader, and it injures something else for you to then coin execute. Yeah, so I prefer this, I think, just some of the other ways, like another war leader was insta lost that way. Yep. And Gentle Megasaur as well, same thing. If it gets anything, you know, plants, plus one, plus one, Divine Shield, any of the above just makes life very, very miserable. So at least this way, they, they took a chance. That there are quite a lot of small things in this deck, so mm -hmm. uh, figuring that Boss is going for the biggest push possible, and therefore there might not be so much in the hand. And at least if it hits a Megasaur or something, okay, you might die, but it stops it from getting all those buffs as well. Yeah, pulling the Megasaur out there would actually be a big win for them because it means, you know, Megasaur hitting the board for four mana here would carry a big battle cry with it. If it was plus three damage, then that rat just would get dealt with so much more efficiently. And the fact they pulled Stonehill Defender is a massive win for them, of course, on both counts because it's a small minion that they've pulled out in response and it's also denied a potential Tarim, Tyrion, um, Grime Street Protector, whatever it might be, whatever huge value taunt comes off it. So Lagabus is now in a mess because he knows the fact that the coin has now been preserved means uh, Coin Brawl is an availability for the next turn. Yeah, and the play looks kind of suspicious as well. It what does. is my opponent doing with all this stuff mm -hmm. if he hasn't got a handful of brawls and big taunts? And why is he playing Dirty Rat? So Boss is going to have to just... Do the time-honored way of trying to beat Warrior when you're running low on resources, and that is just press your hero power button and hope it all works out. Yeah, look how miserably low value this hand is now. The difference between this Stonehill Defender being played from hand and being summoned from the rat here is just night and day. Like, imagine how much better this hand looks with a with a Sunkeep Atarium in it. Yeah, the other thing I've just realized hitting that Stonehill Defender, by the way, is it also is a giveaway as to what the deck likely is. Yes, that's a good point. Um, so they, they're... They're realizing now Portugal will realize there could be an equality here, so it might put them off playing the big taunt. Whereas if it was the other version of the deck, then they may just go, hey, here's here's a big taunt. Let's wait. Yeah, I think as long as that war leader's there, you don't want to allow them to just continue to sink value from the right. war leader buff into your taunt minions. So, you know, just deal with the war leader first, then you can start walling out with big taunts if needs be. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but the secret is going to proc. Redemption is going to go down. Unfortunately, the Hydrologist was played before War Leader, so Redemption doesn't end up being devastating. I'm sure Portugal considered all those uh, implications, just rewound back mentally, thought about all the ordering, what would come back if it was Redemption, realized that uh, and a, little, a little extra 2-1 here is not going to be a big deal. Yeah, going to be able to get maybe another few hits in over the next few turns, then suddenly Portugal are looking like they're going to be able to stabilize. But don't forget, this is the mid Paladin deck. We've seen a lot of the small stuff come out early. That means that cards such as Tyrion, Tarim, maybe even a Ragnaros are still to come. And Portugal have had to panic a little bit to deal with this board. So the second push from Greece could still be enough to take this game to a very long game and possibly even snatch it at the end. They need to get that second push, though. If they just continue to draw early game Murlocs here, then they're going to be in a bit of trouble. They need Tarim. They need Curator. Curator would be the big win right now. Right. Just, you know, Megasaur plus Primordial Drake being added to this hand, unless they play a second Hungry Crab, in which case I guess there's a chance that that's the beast that gets picked up off Curator instead of the, uh, instead of the Megasaur, which would probably not be ideal for them, but hey. And two weeks ago, this is how fast this meta is moving, let's not forget, two weeks ago we were saying that Lay on Hands would be a way out of this. Yeah. We haven't seen that card for two weeks, we saw it every day two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was even before like the Murloc package was even considered core to, to a mid-range Paladin deck. I mean, the, the I think Savitz had success with a list early on that he got to rank 2, maybe even rank 1 Legend with. High Legend anyway, let's say. And it had, uh, what, Lightfused Stegadon is the name of the card? <laughs> yeah. The Adapt Your Silverhand Recruits guy in there. It's crazy stuff to see the leaps and bounds that Paladin in particular has taken from a kind of ignored class early on because day 1, day 2, everyone went, alright, let's try the quest. All right, quest sucks. <laughs> forget, forget Paladin. Forget about Paladin for now. And it took about another week until anyone came back to it and figured out there's actually just a really powerful mid-range Paladin engine in the form of the new Murlocs being added. Yeah, I think Cross, yet again, was one of the first people to actually start putting the Murlocs into this. Cross he often is. Always just turns up as guy who made deck and then didn't bother playing much Hearthstone. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous.
Yeah, I mean, responsible for uh, one of the core builds of Secret Paladin back in the day, one of the first people to really put together a competitive uh, Shirazin Miracle Rogue along with Casey. Um, massive, massive influencer in deck building, especially in the uh, in the Chinese scene. Yeah, and doesn't even class himself as a Hearthstone pro currently. He just plays decks, plays card decks games, for fun, plays yep. card games, um, all of them, and still manages to just change the meta game. Some people are just very talented, Lorinda. I know. Thank you. <laughs> glad, Appreciate it. Glad, glad you took that in the uh, well-meant intention. That it was given. Meanwhile, Boss is managing to force through still decent amounts of damage and dodge rocket shots at the same time. How bad is this admin in the rocket? Give up already! You suck! <laughs> <laughs> hey! hey we right. did it. Okay, so now oh, I never thought I'd be so pleased to see a rocket lift off. That's Which it. Run away. Sword? Run away. No, be gone. No, no, your moment is done. Be gone. So, Shield Slam here is actually really efficient if they want to play the, the five mana taunt. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it's efficient enough, but as you mentioned, they've seen Stonehill Defender come out now, so they know there are high value targets to hit. Right. They know that Execute and that Shield Slam might have to line up against some powerful cards, and we can see. It's Hungry Crab Equality that's in hand. Right, but, but remember, in their minds, that op those cards were in the opening. I think Equality was the first natural draw post Mulligan, right. maybe the second. So that's been there since turn one, turn two. And Hungry Crab was just in the opening hand. So from Portugal's perspective, they're well within their rights to be reading those cards as Rag Light Lord and Tyrion from this. Right, point. and even if they're not, the quest is on two. Yes. Which means there's at least five more draws here for Greece. And Rag Light Lord and. You know, Tyrion, those cards will be in hand at some point before the quest is completed, most likely. That's less than ideal. And we might start to see a little bit of uh, confusion come into the reads over the next couple of turns, because they're going to find out that neither of those cards that are stuck are Curator. That's one that's been eliminated at this point that right. they might be expecting. And then over the coming turns, they're going to find out that they're not Tyrion or Rag Lightlord either. So what kind of read they want to put this on, and what exactly is this Hungry Crab doing right now? Because you can eat 1-1 one, one and get plus 2, plus 2 at any given point. It may just be what I was talking about a few minutes ago, is just waiting for that extra push. This push doesn't look like it's going to succeed. You're trying to maybe you know, sort of tickle the warrior into brawling again or playing too many minions so you can equality and then go for yet another push mm -hmm. when, when you manage to get control of the board one more time. I wonder how much of it is just the value of that guy being in the hand and representing potentially right. other cards that it could be as well. I mean, if he does, if he does eat a Murloc and become a 3-4, it is obviously better than a 1-1 one, one Murloc, but having an actual 1-1 one, one Murloc has a lot of value when you haven't played a Megasaur yet. Very true, when you haven't played Tarim yet either. Right, so maybe the crab comes down even later than that. We saw with Russia the other day, the way to play these decks often is to just not do anything for long periods of time until you're ready to win the game. Yeah, a little bit more so back in the day against Control Warrior, but if this, as we mentioned, this Taunt Warrior, this is only three out of seven so far, so they're not really doing a very good job of being a Quest Warrior right now, which means you do kind of have permission to do nothing for a little while right. just yet, because they're not getting very far with their own win condition just yet. This might, however, be the prelude to equality time. You probably don't get a better equality than this over the course of the game, depending what comes off the top here. Um, playing to the you know, the top of their deck will be if we are quality now. We should start drawing some eight drops. Ooh, is there anything better though? They try desperately not to equality if they can help it. They're just not finding the value. Rockpool Hunter again, just consistently drawing early game Murlocs. And if it wasn't for that equality and for that Stonehill Defender that we've already seen, I think we'd all be sitting here just assuming this is the aggressive build. Right. Interesting that they could have chosen to buff the Wick of Flame. After the equality? Uh, is Wicker Flame a Murloc now? No. <laughs> just checking. Yeah, but they could have chosen to do it anyway, but it just wouldn't have been very good. Wow. Okay, shield block is drawn and no need to play... Oh, actually, is there a need to play the Tar Lord here? If the Megasaur is appearing in the hand, yeah, that would probably have been lethal or at least close enough to it. Jeez, to a bit of this draw, I think... Wordlessly, like a boss, just turned and said exactly the same thing to the guy on his uh, right hand shoulder. Whoever it is that was giving the pre game massage. Indeed. 
What are these cards and why? Remember that Greece are zero two for all we've said about their, it's crazy, their teamwork and how everything. Are they zero they're two? zero two. I don't know how they're zero two. Like I mean, the, the Greek they've scene. Two, they've lost two matches. I said this yesterday. The Greek scene is strong enough. That's, that's a good point. That is how the format works. Uh, the Greek scene is strong enough where I think they could field a B team in this tournament that would be equally competitive with the majority of other countries. Right. And actually, that's one of the small problems with their team. When the, when I got that top 100 list, mm -hmm. a lot of them were from 60 to 95. Sure. So you've got 13 players in the top 100, but you haven't got, with all respect to Lyka Boss, who's had a tremendous season, and obviously Tofino, who's not on this team, mm -hmm. they haven't got a star player on their team playing at the moment. Fair. They've got a lot of very good players, and there's another four five or seven or nine other very good players. All right. Yeah, I, I like that characterization. I think that is a, a fair assessment of the Greek scene. And again, especially in this format where everything is collaborative, the strength of one incredible player. If you have one player on your team who is top five, top ten in the world, not on ladder finishes, in overall skill, right? That one player can actually raise the... Uh, raise the power of your team significantly, perhaps more benefit to you than having four top 100 players. And we saw that in Tesper, of course, with um, yes. Nob Lord winning, <laughs> winning Tesper, not on his own, but <laughs> you know, he turned up and his teammates watched. And they even said that we, we want to do it for him, we just do what he says, basically. Mm -hmm. And that showed the power of, of a very powerful player in, in a sort of big fish, small pond situation, that one. In the meantime, Stonehill Defender is seven out of seven. Dirty Rat is now a choice as well with the hand being empty, can be paired nicely with the Execute if they would like, but there is enough. Spare mana here after they select their uh, their Stonehill Taunt to be able to take a free shot on this with the Hero Power if they want, or they can just expend the Execute and just choose to start pushing damage. Some pretty good choices there, especially with this handful of cards as well. It's just. The one on the far left seems solid to me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I don't think you're in it. So you are in a hurry. I was going to say you're not in a hurry. You are in a hurry. Tyrion plus Megasaurs and things can get out of hand quickly. Yeah. Uh, so you want to make sure you get this over within three or four turns. It's not like the olden day where you'd get into this position and you would win at some point. Yeah, I mean, you're, the line. you're in an insanely good position right now. Your opponent's out of cards. So let's invent weird worlds where you lose. Uh, Divine Favor, for example. If that card is in this deck, that is a way you can lose. So let's just kill our opponent before they have chances to draw right. any card that you can think of that might get them out of this mess. The quicker you kill them, the less chance they have to draw it. And we are still in any card you can think of meta because Greece have to win this match. They cannot afford to save any tech for other events mm -hmm. that may or may not be coming up, like um, the qualifiers for HCT this sure. weekend. You go with your tech today if you have it. So we haven't seen any expensive cards. For instance, Divine Favor, it's a 0.0 something percent chance, but it's a card that could be lying in this deck as far as Portugal are concerned. Yeah, there's an old school phrase from the fighting game community, STSFN, which means save that stuff for nationals. Um, the meaning being, if you have something, if you figured out something insane in a fighting game, you hold it back until a big tournament. You don't go and win your local for it for 20 quid. You save it up for a major and get a bunch of cash in your pocket. That attitude is actually not particularly prevalent in Hearthstone. People tend to share things immediately. They stream it. They post yeah. it on Twitter. They're you know trying to um, you know push content. You know gain clicks, gain Twitter followers, gain Twitch followers. Um, we don't see too much hidden tech in Hearthstone these days. I think we might see that start to happen. I think previously, um, as the game was growing, that it was a race to discover the deck that was there. Yeah. Now I feel that there isn't just a deck there anymore. There's a whole wide range of decks available to be found. So, oh, I found a really good deck. I don't think there'll be that panic amongst maybe the top streamer who can make his name by discovering the deck. Mm -hmm. I don't think there'll be that same panic that, oh no, someone else is obviously going to work this out. Okay. We shall wait and see, but if you are wondering why we are talking about the way the uh, Hearthstone community works when it comes to discovering new decks, it's because mostly this game is a formality, apart from those ridiculous possibilities that we mentioned before. There would have to be something out of the ordinary for Greece to find a way back into this, but the uh, Death Rail Plants on the 1-1 one -one definitely does make this turn a little bit more awkward than it could be for Dr. Boom and for Portugal. So, Curator. Yes. That's the immediate answer to every question about how people come back into games. Sure. So that's how we start. Then what? A quality consecration, uh, Megasaur. Both, both the qualities have been used. Uh, might have a third. 
Seems unlikely. Okay, so I'm struggling to think of scenarios where they actually get back Ooh, into this. What a champion. 1-8 Murloc, summon 2-1-1 one, one plants. Good card. <laughs> Look at us. Applauding the outdoor peacekeeper. Wow. Like, like a Baus is a troll. He is a troll. He's, it's, it's hilarious. You get somebody like that who wants to set up a community, how can you not like, like this guy? <laughs> Like, I'm going to troll you if you don't help my community. <laughs> what, what does that even do? You'd buff him. He has zero attack right now. Why would you want to give him one? I think he's trying to put him on one health. That doesn't even make any then, sense oh. as a meme. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Michael Bass is too entertaining. Everything makes sense as a meme. I guess that's a fair <laughs> argument, yeah. That's how I live my life. Mm -hmm. I've got to make sense somewhere. <laughs> How long is he going to do this for, do you think? Like a boss, please. We have beds to go to. <laughs> the humanity. Come on. So, after a little bit of um, bossing around, we're getting 1-0 to Portugal there in what I think is an unfavoured matchup, personally. Uh, from the Quest Warrior side against yeah. uh, Control Paladin? Maybe. It's, um, I think, like, the, the curve does have to line up for the Paladin. I, I confess, I don't know the actual, you know, any hard data that we have off the top of my head in terms of, you know, meta reports and so on, but the curve does have to line up because you right. saw early aggression happened and that not be good enough. It has to be early aggression into timely big dudes, right? It's weird that an early brawl managed to win it on this occasion. Yeah. Normally that brawl comes much later sure. if you're going to win the game as the Warrior. So mm -hmm. things did line up. The, the early curve looked really good and it just didn't, develop, which is really unusual. I think ratting the Stonehill Defender was backbreaking in yes. that position, though, because a Tarim or a uh, Tyrion would have been completely different in the course of that matchup. But Deathalor, another player who I've uh, had the honor of meeting and hanging out with this time at uh, Gfinity Major in the United Kingdom. And again, another massively entertaining person just to be around. He's going to be coming up now for Greece, coming up against Ignite, who is someone who we have uh, both had the pleasure of spending a decent amount of time with at uh, Insomnia events and other places as well. Yep. So um, decent, uh, decent, very decent player in his own right. He's going to be going up on the Rogue, and I think he has actually been putting a good amount of work into Quest Rogue, if I remember rightly. So Interesting. Yeah. Although every time, I think, without fail, we have said that about a player this weekend, or whatever we are, this is a weekend to me. Um, that player has ended up playing the opposite deck to what they've been showing everybody. Yeah, and weirdly enough, you can actually take that as a stamp of accuracy, right? right? Because that's how things are supposed to work. If we have picked up on a pattern enough to be able to talk about it and explain it to you guys, that means that person that we have noticed the pattern of is recognizing that right. as an exploitable trait and will then change it up so that the team that they're up against cannot do the same thing. As long as it doesn't keep happening. Like, it's, a, it's an exploitable trait if you always do the opposite as well. True. So it'll be interesting to see exactly how the teams develop as the weeks go forward because there's several more weeks for this you know, to work out. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to see. Interesting to see Death Lord, by the way, saying interesting a lot <laughs> because... Uh, the feedback from Boss is that Deathlaw actually suffers from nerves quite badly, but he's fantastic at spotting mistakes that are about to happen. Excellent. That is actually really good knowledge because we've talked a lot about, you know, the team dynamic and, you know, do you all just sit and kind of hive mind and all just chat out each turn? Right. Or do you have specific roles? Do you say, you're our spotter, just, you know, keep track of every read we make, figure out which cards are which, where's the coin, has it been used, which cards are randomly generated, what's this card, what's that card, is there another guy that's just looking out for technical mistakes, making sure positioning is correct, trades happen in the right order, etc, etc. So if they, the Greek team, view Deathalore in a particular role like that, right. then that actually could be very beneficial for their team dynamic as a whole. Yeah, I agree entirely. The only strange thing about that is they put him on twice today into the ace match if it comes that far, mm -hmm. which means he's Spotting and driving at the same time. And they said that he struggles with nerves a bit. To as some well. extent. Interesting. Yeah. And that doesn't seem like a player that you want necessarily in your ace match for you. Right. If, if you're the driver and you're a little bit edgy, right. you know, and they say, hey, do this, and the, the clock's running, I've done that when you've coached me before. It's like, hey, do this. It's like, no, I don't know which button to press help. I have to say, I, I have not had that impression of no, Death Law at neither. all myself from my experiences with him. So that is surprising to me just a little bit. And yeah, Ignite. As uh, predicted, if you want to look at it that way, is coming out with the Quest Rogue here. And it's Pirate Warrior looking to start the beatdown for Greece. But crucially, 
Glacial Shard, two bouncers in hand for Ignite for Portugal. This is how you win this matchup. If there's any way to get it done, Glacial Shard is it. Yeah, and the other way you win this matchup is by using that coin to get that hero power going and ignoring the quest in your hand because you haven't cost yourself anything. You haven't decided which minion you're going to be bouncing yet, so you can wait for the quest to make sure these pirates start to die. Attacks in. Re-equips weapon and passes, which means Ignite now has the opportunity to actually take a, a little bit of cheeky ball control here if he wants to. Not very often you get to even be temporarily ahead on the board this early against a Pirate Warrior, but they do have that opportunity available to them now. The issue is, South Sea Deckhand, as I pointed out numerous times, is a card that ideally you want to play post-quest, but when you are facing down such an aggressive deck, it isn't about, can I burst my opponent down super quickly after activating the quest? It's about, can I survive long enough to get to quest country? If I get there, then that's probably job done. So maybe just the 2-1 and the 1-1 on board right now are just worth having. Yeah, uh, killing those minions that pirates have is pretty easy when you have 5-5 five, five charges, you bounce them back, you do it again, because the pirate minions actually just don't challenge 5-5s five, at all well, with the exception of maybe Naga Corsair. He could also just start the bounce train right now. It looks like that's what's going to happen. He can just shard the face right now and then shadow step it back to hand. This, however, gives more information over to the opponent, though. They know now that it's shard plus bounce shard, which is the potential plan. No, it isn't. It's going to leave it there in play. It's risky. There aren't many ways this can die. South Sea Deckhand is about it in this point, but it is just a little touch of a high risk play. Yeah, I wonder what he's thinking there with not bouncing. Maybe he wants to bounce something else multiple times to do the quest. That's the only thing I can think of, occupying the board with this. And then what's he looking to bounce instead, though? I'm not sure. Because the shard is the card you would normally shard's bounce. Shard's so good. Yeah, the, the, other, the other consideration is that he doesn't want to do it with the shadow step just yet. That being a zero mana card means it's more flexible later on right. to be able to push through. So by leaving it on the board, he can do his first bounce now with a youthful brewmaster and then you know, keep the shadow step for later on while developing alongside it with, say, Firefly. But we will find out what Ignite's intentions are this turn. I'm sure things will become a little bit clearer. And as I mentioned, he's been sinking quite a lot of time into this deck, is my understanding. So if there's something outside the box going to come out, then Ignite is one of the players that we will see. And it looks like that was the thinking. Brewmaster was the intended target. Shadow Step, just a more flexible card to have available later on. Yeah, and you mentioned this about Oskarka. Suddenly there are pros who are realizing this deck is good. Yes. This is what happened with Patron. I'm sorry to make the analogy. I know, but the people are starting to realize this deck is good. Yeah. Let's see how good it actually is by really putting the hours in. Yes. And is it actually amazing, but only amazing for 10 people in the world? Uh, as Patron kind of was at times. Towards the end, it was good for a lot more players, but there were times where only a few people in the world could actually get a lot of wins with Patron. Going for face freeze instead of minion freeze here. If trades happen, he wants trades to happen with the minions. He doesn't want the War Axe to be able to hit this 3-2 and then the minions to stick around on the board. That's his goal here. Glacial Shard has been played twice now and returned to the hand for zero mana. So it's possible with uh, one more bounce effect that the job just gets done here. If the job does get done, those pirates won't be doing any more damage anytime soon. But there's a lot of damage coming in this turn. And even if the quest gets completed, there are two charge minions in hand, but it might not quite be enough. Yeah, I think with this um, youthful brewmaster threatening board position here, is playing the Frothing potentially more damage over a couple of turns than the Corcoran Elite? Um, obviously, Corcoran having charge is a big deal. If it, even if it can charge on the turn it comes down, having it in play for an extra turn just nets you twice as much damage anyway. But the fact of the matter is, is that this Brewmaster is going to trade with one of your minions. So if that is happening, you probably want Frothing Berserker on board to gain benefit from that, since the Corcoran can just charge face at any given time. Yes, and you don't get the chance to catch those pesky rogue minions actually on the table until they're 5-5s five fives very often. So having the opportunity to get a 4-4 four four frothing, this might be the only time they're going to get that value from it. Right, so this is Glacial Shard number three that will come down this turn more than likely, but they, I mean, that, that would be a complete bailout of the quest strategy is the problem. They need a way to reduce damage. The only way they have is the Glacial Shard, but there's no further bouncer, so it would just mean leaving the shard on the board to die, and that would be three out of four bounces sunk into one card, which you're then just leaving around to get murdered by any means necessary. 
and all of that points to the fact that Novice Engineer might be the start here. After you've analysed whether you can afford to maybe just blow a deck hand into trading hero power, three, three. Yeah. deck hand, stone toss, but it's so much mana just to get the deck hand to charge though is the problem. And the frothing gets buffed and you still take face damage from some bits and yep. it doesn't look much fun. Hero power, deck hand and patches still remember can go into the 3-3 three, three, and then a stone toss ball can take care of the uh, the frothing berserker alongside. So yeah, it's, it's doable. Yeah. Spending all of the available time there, freezing down the frothing, clearing up this stuff. And just the proof, if anybody needs it, this is the control deck in this matchup. Yep. And it can change fast. If you do complete that quest, this matchup changes incredibly quickly. But crucially, there is the Glacial Shard on board. So there is a, there's a very bizarre uh, bluff into double bluff, triple bluff situation that comes out with Quest Rogue, where you kind of say, hey, this, they just dropped their minion on the board that they've been bouncing the right. whole time. If I am to give them credit as to being a good player, that means they have the second one in the hand. So killing this one isn't relevant because they have the second one in the hand. But right. then the player who's actually in control of the quest rogue knows that that is a mentality that people look at. So they can actually try and abuse these weird situations. That's not what that this is. This right. is just desperation of needing to freeze the Frothing Berserker. But it's something to look out for as the deck develops, because I think more than once over uh, competitive Hearthstone's future, we will see people try and bluff this kind of situation. Yeah, and I think that's another thing. I keep saying about how the game is evolving, but that's another thing that is evolving more and more with these bigger hand sizes in general, although this particular game isn't so much. <laughs> uh, oh, one card off. Ouch. One card off. Second shard, please. That is not second shard. Second shard not happening here. No way in the real world to kill the 11-4. That's a very, very quick equaliser there for Greece. Yep, Pirate Warrior taking another game. We've seen a little bit of a Pirate Warrior resurgence over today. A couple of players coming out with it. And mixed performances for it. It's had some victories over Mage. There was that uh, cracking game between the Pirate Warrior and the Aggro Druid, right. which yeah, yeah, you guys caught it very well at the time. The uh, the mana manipulation on the Living Mana to set up the Hero Power. Pokerback and Check Cloud then confirmed it when you were interviewing. That's exactly what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good feeling, right? When you call something out and then the player just echoes the same thing right. when you get to talk to them. But that was a really well played game, and it, it goes to show you that yes. These control matchups are fantastic. There's, you know, there's a lot of skill, a lot of decisions that go into them. But the aggro mirrors, there is, uh, there is some very real consequences to your actions in those matchups as well. So one, one, and now into Cebu versus Seriza, and it's going to be Druid versus Shaman. I think we've got a fairly good feel for how Shaman decks work, even if we never know which of the extra eight cards on top of the 22 are going to be in there. Mm -hmm. Druid, still this thing that is becoming a bit of a meme for casters already. Could be anything, but it's probably Jade. That's the phrase of the weekend. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think aggro is uh, definitely a successful deck. But I, I think the first week or two, I was really advocating uh, for aggro druid as being one of the most success, uh, one of the most powerful decks in the new format. Um, I've since come around to the Jade train. I think Jade is actually just absurd, and people but don't quite realize how good it is. And um, we've talked about, you know, it's it's healthy in the meta as a control buster in most of our opinions. Yep. The problem comes in when it's also just very resilient against aggro, which it now kind of is. Yeah, just, double, just putting in the Tar Creeper seems to make all of the difference. Tar Creeper, Gluttonous Ooze, double Earthen Scales, double Feral Rage, double Primordial Drake. That that seems like enough tools to be able to stop aggro, and I didn't even mention Jade Behemoth. Right, and you made the point earlier, just just putting scales on an auctioneer is so enough awkward, to beat right? everything yeah. just because they have to kill it. Mm -hmm. Unless they can actually kill you that turn, they will not win the game if they leave that auctioneer up. So you're healing for five, plus the five you get armor. You're basically healing for ten. Yeah. Pretty solid, but Pretty we have not seen people abandon Aggro Druid just yet. As we mentioned, the game from the Czech Republic was an Aggro Druid game that was very well navigated to get them a win against a Pirate Warrior. So it's it's definitely up in the air, but it doesn't. It seems with more and more consistency that people are moving towards this uh, Spirit Echo build of Shaman. And it makes a lot of sense if if Jade Druid, let's say, let's go and say it's the best deck, which I don't think it is, but let's say it's the best deck. Okay, let's play Jade Shaman with the same cards. It's not quite the same cards, though, is you, it? You, yeah. All right, fine. <laughs> you've got the you've got the repeated 
sort of infinite loop. It's not an infinite loop. You do run out of cards eventually, but sure. you've got infinite loops going on where you get cards back in your hand and heal again. It's the same sort of stuff which aims to go a very long game and then start making 9-9. Nine nine. Yeah, the problem, I think the big difference is the card draw. Druid has real right. um, significant card draw engine, whereas Shaman has to curve more consistently or find ways to play removal, which they do much better than a Druid does. Sure, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm not saying it's as good as, but if one of these is the best and you can copy that with another class, let's have that as a tier 5 backup plan. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, We're going to see it right here. Yep, and it is going to be the aggro Druid on the other side from Greece. Uh, Raven and Innovate in the opening hand. Uh, two of the, the strongest cards that you do want to look for, but nothing powerful to drop with the Innovate right now. And they've hit a Bluegill Warrior, which always makes me question. I've questioned the Fiendra package since right back in the day as to how this really makes any sense to put four bad cards in your deck so you can draw one good one. Yeah, I think I agree with you normally. Mm -hmm. I think because Living Go Matter on. is a two of, <laughs> you sure? and you'd like three of them. Yes. So I can sort of handle the Finger package in this one deck. I, I mean, I, I drastically prefer Bitter Tide Hydra as my my okay. third my third uh, one of. And actually, sold. I wish that you'd um, asked uh, check the Czech Republic the question. I was watching that series very very curiously because we saw Hydra in their Agro Druid. We didn't see any Murlocs, so I was actually curious as to whether oh. they were playing the Finger package at all, whether they're thinking the same way as I have. And I've seen uh, Zires, Zires, however we we're pronouncing right. that these days, playing the same thing because also. Hungry Crab is very popular tech right now. So do you want to put Murlocs in your deck and get caught in the crossfire of people shooting at aggressive Paladins? That's a really good point. And yeah, that's probably what's going on there. And uh, I answered somebody the other day, I might have been with Raven actually. Somebody got a Finger from a random effect mm -hmm. on a different class to a Murloc class. And I'm like, how good's your Finger now? You say it's a great card. It's probably uh, Firelands Portal, right? Five drops. It was probably a Firelands right. Portal, yeah. And it made it made the point really clear that this card is not busted unless you give it some concessions. Yes. Because this card is just a two four. Yeah. Two four stealth. Not great. Not great. So therefore, the concession is you play bad Blue Guild Warrior, which a lot of people try to argue isn't a bad card. It's a bad card. Thank you. Yeah. And then uh, War Leader, which apparently is okay because it's a three three for three. Also a bad card. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Sorted. All sold as we go into Greek's second turn. Yeah. I mean, War Leader specifically in the more Paladin, in the Paladin decks that we're seeing where you just always have Murlocs in play right. is a fantastic card. Right. When you only have four other Murlocs in your deck and your goal is to not draw them, then yeah, <laughs> it, it's not that good. Let's put cards in my deck that I don't want to draw. Yeah. That automatically sells it. Ooh, that's a far sight. I was talking before about how the card draw is the big issue, both with you just at the start, just briefly, but also um, talking with Raven about the kind of Jade Druid, uh, Jade Charmin comparison and how the card draw is the big problem for them. And I mentioned that far sight is just generally agreed upon to be a very weak card but generally agreed upon apparently everywhere except in Portugal. Something that we're learning from Glyph in Mage is that there is value to being able to play a card early. So in Mage, you play your Glyph for two, you get a reduction of two. It costs the same amount of mana, but you can't flame strike on five. You can borrow the two mana from the Glyph, so you can flame strike on turn five. A normal flame strike, no matter how you work out the mana, always comes down for seven mana. Yes. But if you can split the seven mana over two turns, Mm -hmm. The card actually becomes more powerful. I'm with you. Uh, it's like inver It's like overload. Yeah. You get to overload your cards of choice. Yeah, like and uh, Farsight kind of does that for you. It does, but the, the the powerful part of Glyph that you're not really factoring into that explanation is Discover. Sure, if, if, no, no, I understand entirely. I'm just right. saying that when people have realized this, mm -hmm. maybe cards like Farsight actually, hey, I can speed up playing Aya to turn four. Sure. Or, I mean, I or repeat as infinite. If, if Farsight was discover a card from your deck and discount it, then yeah, oh, I'd, I'd, be, okay. I'd, I'd be jamming that thing all day, every day. But in, you know, drawing one card at random and getting choose between three of them are just very, very different effects. But this is a card at random that you've chosen to put in your deck versus a card at random from all of Hearthstone. That's true. So there is some... I'm still not claiming this is Glyph, by the way. Otherwise, everyone will be playing it. But it is a card at random that you have chosen to play in your deck, and therefore it's probably at least vaguely synergetic with what you're doing. Yeah, there's actually very little disagreement going on here. What you, what you are listening to at home, ladies and gentlemen, is two players, two people very aggressively playing Devil's Advocate with each other. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'm winning. Okay. As always. Sure. Okay, I'm not. Anyway, this is a very awkward-looking turn. Uh, but on 28, it can afford to be a little bit awkward. I actually can afford to buy a little time here. <laughs> <laughs> what 
Why is this? Why oh, we, my goodness. Why are we just pointing inappropriate three-mana cards at each other's faces? I think that was a retaliation attack, to be perfectly yeah, honest. Yeah, I guess that's fair. Oh, Savage Roar. I like that Hex, by the way, over the Storm. This is um, something... I was watching a ESL UK game. Uh, it was Green Sheep versus somebody. And there was a very particular turn in which uh, the Lightning Storm came down. And since it uh, low rolled on a particular minion, the game ended. Green Sheep actually reviewed the game afterwards. And I was in his uh, Twitch chat talking to him about it. And we both agreed that um, the decision to Storm was just too early. And it was exactly this kind of situation where he could have hexed first and then just, you know, increased his odds over time. So instead of just firing off the storm, he can go hex first, take a bit of damage, jade lightning again, maybe take a little bit more damage, set yourself up into a position where the lightning storm is more guaranteed to be a clear later on. Well, not only would it be more of a clear, but it, you don't have to worry about the overload. And there's Finger. Yes. Yeah, you know, may get for yourself a 50-50 at Finger at some point down the line if you get the totem setup correct. No raw, just Bluegill go here, choosing not to cash in on an oh. eight damage Savage Raw while they had the board presence. That's interesting because when do they feel they're going to get more board presence than they have right now? Unless, like you said in game one, they're valuing cards in hand and hiding information. That's a Black Knight. Hey, Black Knight, how are you going? Have they just given respect here to the fact that there is no Storm in hand? Because they, they their read is, hey, if they had Storm, they would have stormed that board of three right. minions on the previous turn. So they believe that it could stick. Uh, well, guess what? It's not going to stick much longer, and your hand is two three-mana, eight-damage cards right now. So I suggest you probably use one of them. I think that is one of the most common... I'm going to call it a mistake, but that's an exaggerated word, that good players make against other good players. It's saying, oh, if they had removal spell here, they would definitely have played it. To which the response is, you don't know how I think, okay? Right. On, on, on ladder, sure. <laughs> yes. I know that rank 47,000 legend player probably lightning storms there. Yes. Because I've played on, on the times. Chinese <laughs> server that you yeah. play on where they have 47,000 legend. 70,000 legend. 70? What? <laughs> yeah. But against another good player, I think sometimes people who play a lot of ladder fall into the trap of thinking, oh, yeah, they would have stormed here. And not thinking, what would I have done here? Right. Not, not always. It's just, I think it's the number one trap that top players fall into occasionally. I agree. Stop doing that. That's unnerving. Sorry. Would you like me to just be generally obstinate and disagreeable? Well, at least then I know who I'm talking to. Fair enough. So, this time choosing to do the Savage Roar and lots of damage coming in, but will they ever get any substantial damage again? Well, if there's no Storm coming down, then it's uh, going to be the same again on the following turn. Four plus eight more for lethal, so it's going to have to be a Storm on this turn. It looks like if uh, Cereza and Portugal are going to stabilize in this game. And they have held out on the Storm, and this is the exact situation. There's only There were three three health minions on the board. This is the kind of thing I was talking about and the, the allegory that I was making with the Green Sheep game. There were three three health minions on the board before. If it even low rolls on two of them, you're in a mess. Right. Now, there is only one. If it low rolls on that, you can still finish it off with your Jade Claws. So you are now guaranteed a board clear with your Lightning Storm, whereas two turns ago, it was a huge risk. It was, you know, L-U-L-R-N-G, right? Like, if, the, if it had gone wrong, then you would have thrown your hands up in the air and said that I'm so unlucky. But the point being, there was no reason to take that risk in the first place. Yep, the only downside of doing it... Oh my goodness. If he hits, if he hits the frog, is it... It's not... No, if he hits the frog, it is still lethal. Zero mana devolve, though. Hello. Is that enough, though? Devolve. He would still have to kill something, which I assume he's going to. Wow. Just not respecting the savage, second Savage Roar. And was there any need to do this against Druid in particular? Oh, boy. He doesn't attack. He doesn't attack. Two, uh, plus, eight plus. two plus eight plus hero power. And a patches, I believe, which is still in there that can add to the damage. That's crazy. Absolutely insane, especially as the way more than any other aggro deck, Druid really struggles. Of course, they're saving the storm for, my, um, for living mana. Hmm? Saving the storm for living mana. I mean, mana. yeah, that's great, but you are dead right now. Sure, I think but if, you're, if your opponent's turn last turn was uh, to bank Savage Raw damage instead of develop any more minions, I think there's a pretty good read that they are trying to kill you with that other card from hand. Sure, but are they trying to bait you? There's one more Savage Raw, there's two living manas. Maybe the decision was they could have this. If they've got it, we die. Proved. That's fair. Um, but if, if they haven't got it and they play Living Manor, what on earth do we do to kill six two twos next turn? Mm -hmm. And there's two of those in their deck. There's only one more Savage Roar. Plus, they didn't Savage Roar the turn before when they had four minions on board, 
which may have been a bit of a bait. It's That's like, actually a really good point. Yeah, yeah, they didn't have Savage Raw this turn. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely true. I do I do actually like a lot of the things that Portugal did in that matchup. I think they were suitably patient, and it's very easy for me to say with Cast Division that they, they should have thrown out that storm, but it was a very intimidating board state. I mean, okay, let's pretend that even the the, the Savage Raw wasn't the card in hand. Let's but let's just say a board buff gets drawn right. and more damage goes through. What are you still not gonna storm that board? Like what's your plan then? It feels like eventually that board was getting Lightning Storm, right. whether they living mannered or not. I think they were just really, really trying to find an extra removal spell, maybe a portal, so they could have done it sure. very cheaply. That's yeah, fine. And that way keep the Lightning Storm for the living mana and pretty much guarantee a win if they went down that route. Yeah, fair enough. But anyway, Logan is now going to rock up for Greece, and it is Ginger for Portugal. And I think uh, Ginger so far has been a, a little bit of the equivalent of uh, like a boss yes, on the Greek side. So. Just, uh, you know, really trying to big up his team and uh, a little bit of smack talk to the opponents here and there as well. And this is really a, a showdown of two of the most overtly confident countries that we have seen in this tournament so far. Yeah, I was unfair to Ginger. I didn't tell him I was casting last week and he said he was going to win 100%. I said, can I quote you? He still didn't know I was casting. He said, yes, you can quote me. So I did. And they went 2-0 down and Ginger ended up winning two of the next three games to win 3-2. Does that qualify as entrapment? Don't know. Okay. But this week I spoke to him and he says, are you going to try and make me say I'm 100% again? <laughs> And I was nice. I said, actually, I'm not going to hold you to anything this week. You get a week off this week, Ginger. So he didn't try and force any opinions upon me. He just he just let it go for a week this time around. Fair enough. So uh, we're going to see Druid from the other side now come up against the Priest, I believe, from Greece. So, again... Uh, <laughs> it's this annoying thing that we keep saying, right? Yes. Um, but we saw before Jay Druid having to try and fight off a Silence Priest and not doing a particularly good job of it, needing to enlist some help from their good friend yogg -Saron to get the job done at the end. But it's not going to be that. It's going to be what looks very much like a Dragon Priest from Logan coming up against the Jay Druid. Now, back in the day, this was a hotly contested matchup. People would say that Dragon Priest was favored. They could just curve too quickly. We they could just get there before Jay Druid got the job done. Then people said, hey, well, you know, Jay Druid just have time. They eventually just come back into it and take over. And then the first group of people come back and say, no, that's because the priests are trading too much. They just need to hit face every turn. It went back and forth like this for weeks and weeks on months on end. And we never really came to a consensus. Ooh. And now we have a brand new meta to I play with. I think the priest was favored big time in the old meta. Good like, for you. Like big time, 65. Good for you. But now, <laughs> thanks. I had an opinion for the first time in my life and I've been shot down. I'm going back to sitting on the fence. Well, no, Somebody's I mean, going to win this game of Hearthstone and just, I don't know who. It's just kind of the whole point I was making, right? right. Like you're, say, you're saying that you felt like Priest was 65% favoured. I could just about find some other caster that thinks that Jay Druid was probably 65 Yeah, but maybe he was having a rest. Okay, fair enough. So, we have definitively solved who was favoured in the old <laughs> meta between Dragon Priest and Jade. But in this meta, it's interesting, it right? It is, I agree, yeah. Uh, of course, the Priest has slowed down a little bit. A, well, a lot. Sure. Significantly. It I doesn't mean, have the nightmare, well, the, the crazy early dragons anymore. Yeah, there are some, you know, sweet early game minions that they can still, you know, they can still go one drop, two drop Talon Priest. That's still a curve that's available to them. Uh, but the minions are more synergy based, combo based, um, you know, persistent effect based, rather than just big old pile of idiotic stats on the board that's going to beat you up. And that's something that Jay Druid can get through because it means that they're not killing you as quickly and that you do then have more time to develop into enormous Jay Golems. Yeah, again, the Priest, um, it's just a synergy thing. It's built entirely, not entirely, but mainly around the fact that Draconid Operative is very, very good. Um, <laughs> yes. And because there are fewer dragons now, you have to build it to last longer to make sure that it actually gets to be very, very good. Uh, so it means you need to play the Drake, which means you need to play a slow, slow strategy. You can't just... There just aren't enough dragons worthy of playing to build the deck as a fast Draconid Operative beatdown. And so you end up with this situation where your hand is full of five drops, which Jade Druid likes to see. Yeah, and Shadow Visions, the, the debate as to whether or not you spend your two mana this turn on playing the only two mana card in your hand might seem kind of strange, but this uh, Shadow Visions is a card that is going to evolve in usage over time. Yep. People are going to dig down more into it and uh, work out a lot of the, the mathematical likelihoods of how many cards you want to draw if you're trying to hit specific targets with it. 
Um, in this matchup, you know, extra copies of Dragonfire Potion can be very helpful. Extra copies of Shadow of Death that didn't start in your deck can be very helpful. Um, and if there's an Elise hanging around, maybe holding onto it for that pack later on is just enough. Just a collection of cards might just get you over the line against Jade Druid later on. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of Raven Idol. When it first came out, everyone started playing on turn one, picking a card, getting on with their life. And then it, it came full circle. That's how it ended as well. Yes. But in the middle somewhere, people are saying, especially myself at points, like, let's hold on to this. Let's get the maximum information before playing our Raven Idol because why discover? Discover was kind of new. Why discover until we know what we're discovering for? Yeah. And I think we're going to have the same thing with Glyph going forward as well. It's very possible. You said a lot of things about Raven Idol, though. Yeah, and they were all right. Were they? Like, yep. cut a wild growth for Raven Idol because you get it anyway. Hmm. Yep. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. That is a thing that I said. Yeah. Would you like to stand by your statement that they were all right? I was a crazy youthful person. You were. Then. Yeah, back, back in the 30s. <laughs> wow. Anyway, enough about my IQ and on with this <laughs> game. Potion of Madness is going to allow the 2 2 to be removed. Oh, sorry, to be traded into. As I've just seemed to have killed my co caster. <laughs> oh, that, was, that was genuinely very funny. Well done. So Portugal now have to decide how best to use this mana as Sotl recovers. Just about. Uh, Tar Creeper Hero Power is uh, reasonable here. Urden Scale is just a very high value card potentially in terms of uh, life gain, but you're playing against a priest, so life gain, not the most important thing in the world, but Creeper and Hero Power definitely seems to get the job done pretty nicely. And with a Fandral and an Innovate in your hand, you are ready to explode at any given point if you can pick up the right cards to go with it. Of course, the meme number against Priest here is really useful with Earth and Scales. You can manipulate nearly every card in your deck to have the magic four attack. Yes, Fandral, Jade Behemoth. Anytime you get your, your Jade Golems to 3-3, to three, three, you can get that one up to 4-4 four, four, and then make the next one 4-4 four, four as well. All kinds of magic can happen, but they're just going to potentially just expose their Fandral to a Shadow Word Pain here. Yeah, uh, in fairness, Fandral's not quite the card it used to be in this deck. No, it's, um, no Raven Idol, no Living It's almost roots. a bluff at times. Yeah. It's like, hey, we're going to play Fandral, and you think you have to deal with it in mm. case we've got Nourish. Yeah, Nourish, Wrath, Feral Rage, only very impactful in some matchups. As I just mentioned, health gain, armor gain is not really that big a deal against Priest, so the dual effect on a, on a uh, Feral Rage is not such a big deal. So it's really just the Wrath and Nourish these days. And that very, makes it's essential. That. It doesn't do anything crazy, but it's essential in terms of occasionally you just want to do that Jade Isle deal thing with Auctioneer yeah. in a very, very long game. So the Fandral's really in there for those very long, grindy games where you want to play an 11-11 to 13-13 all on the same turn at the very, very end to finish off a long one. Yeah, and I think they're happy dropping it down there, saying, do you know what? Like, if you spend your turn Shadow of Painting my Fandral, then that's a turn that you're not spending coining Draconid Operative, because the coin is still there. There are cards that have not been played. If we just play something passive like a Tar Creeper this turn, you then go coin Draconid Operative into Draconid Operative. Well, then what then? Then we're in a mess, that's what. Jade also just realizing as we're watching this, when you draconic operative, it doesn't have the best picks. I mean, these are this yeah. isn't this. I thought, oh, this is terrible. And I looked, I thought, actually, well, Jade Idol's fine. It's just that mm. there's loads of Jade stuff in this deck, and none of it helps the priest because they haven't got the other Jades. Yes, uh, and there are very few cards like Swipes One that actually help them. Yeah. And this is one of the points that's just always been in the negative column um, when people were trying to work out where this matchup stood. It's just Draconid Operative is, yeah, it's five out of five, six. There's nothing wrong with it. But in terms of the average card that you um, steal from your opponent's deck, you know, you you have such uh, stellar options as four mana Razorfen Hunter as one of the cards that you can get from your opponent's deck. That's pretty sad. They did choose to go with the minion, uh, with the scales though, rather than going with the Blood Mage so they can challenge this Behemoth. But already when you start trying to challenge behemoths, normally you're in a world of trouble because your opponent just makes bigger and bigger jades. As it happens, Portugal's hand is kind of messy right now. Yeah, and Greece don't have to panic here because one thing that we failed to really talk about yet is their uh, their discovery of the Deathwing from their Netherspite historian. So they have a pretty clear and linear game plan right now, which is do not die for a little while just yet. And now that uh, Mulch is just not a card in the format, Naturalize is not a card that anyone is really playing, if they can just Deathwing a board that does not have ire on it in the future, then that is just going to put them in a dominant position regardless. Yeah, again, like you say, no mulch. Just such a huge deal. Is why people thought the Druid was dead. 
but then they realize you don't need to actually kill things, you just kill your opponent. Yes. And uh, I think Primordial Drake entering the fray has done just enough to be able to stall out um, big minions in the late game, potentially find yourself enough, enough time, Primordial Drake, to just put a problem in the way and then drop a Jade Idol or something alongside it just to get enough power in play to contest any big minion that you might need to in the late game turns. I, think I, keep, I keep singing the praises of this expansion, but something that you said a long time ago to me was... You want to be able to do broken things in card games. Yep. As long as everybody's doing broken things, it's fair. Yep. And that's how the game feels right now. That there's three or four decks that people are saying, hey, this is just the best deck. It's unfair. Yeah, and you know, for, for all the crap I give Raven for talking about Wild all the time, it is the reason why I do actually also really like Wild. Because right. that is just a bunch of people doing the most insane possible things that you can do in Hearthstone, which quite often involves ship's cannon. <laughs> <laughs> The standard feels like that at times. Like it feels like you can do some busted stuff, yes. but your opponent can do busted stuff back to you to counter it, and that's nice. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yet I have again. said that too much. Yeah, I, I agree with your point that I am saying the words I agree too much. Yes, you okay. definitely are. Good. Glad we got that one sorted. I'm so scared right now. What is in Does that mean I have to start disagreeing with Raven? Yes. Okay, cool. Always. That's just always the By point. start, I mean continue. <laughs> okay, Innovate's going to allow the possibility for this Deathwing just to come out on turn eight as one option. It's probably too yeah. messy. Yeah. But it's a choice they now have. Or they can just do a whole lot of stuff in one turn, which is far more likely the reason. Well, Portugal right now have an Innovate and a Dream. How ambitious are you feeling with this Gadgetzan Auctioneer? Um, time to ask the guy on your team who's doing the counting how many spells, how many minions, and you'll get the response, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, was I supposed to be paying attention? <laughs> it's like, I could tell you they, they've, got a, they've got three cards on the left of their hand, they haven't touched for ages, but I have no idea. I mm -hmm. uh, no, but seriously, that is one of the things that a team could have going at this point, and That's a great point. You know, do some maths. And they believe. Even if they whiff here, they can uh, develop this Tar Creeper alongside, and if that's a whiff too, essentially, but they can get develop that alongside as well. But it there is walking extra hard into Dragonfire Potion right now. Yeah. I'm not sure you have to play anything. I guess you do. Okay, if you if you don't develop anything, then just Bookworm or Shadow of Pain number two answers the board. Right. Um, my concern is that uh, Dragonfire Potion was a likely answer to this board anyway, and you're just playing into it even harder. But when you look at the board state with only that 3-6 taunt protecting the Auctioneer, there's just too many options that you might as well at least go ahead and force them to Dragonfire. And Potion. looking at the body language from the players for Portugal, I think they're aware that this didn't feel right. Sometimes you, have, you look at your hand and then you look at what changed after you play your cards. You're like, we didn't do the most here. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's how they're looking. And this is going to be a really big moment for Greece because they're going to clear up and just get going here. It's a very awkward hand to be trying to burn some resources out of your hand because they do need to do that. They will want to get value out of these cards that they do have <laughs> before they just go ahead and jam some Deathwing. But it's a very awkward hand to do that with because Song Stealer kind of demands a specific target. Shadow of Pain demands a specific target. Nether Spite Historian just replaces itself in your hand anyway. Dragonfire Potion, same deal. The only good card in your hand that's good to dump right now is Innovate. And you have nothing to dump it on because every single other card is very awkward. Right, sure. <laughs> Took me a moment to catch up there. I was just thinking about say, mentioning that Logan is playing for Panathinaikos these days. Oh, uh, we have not. No. No, we haven't. He's, he's moved to Panathinaikos, which well-known European soccer team. I was going to say, Panathinaikos soccer for football American club. Friends is there on next. I did not realise that Panathinaikos had joined the ever-growing list of yeah. uh, football clubs that have an esports organisation. They've also got uh, Sami Tequila and the guy whose name we both always butcher. We really must sort that out. Um, Tholimenos. <laughs> yeah, that guy. Yeah, the guy whose name... You let me butcher it for once. It was your turn yesterday. But they're, they're, I don't know how I'm supposed to pronounce an L followed by a W followed by an E. That just doesn't make like sense. Sounds like something I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, you just don't know how to pronounce the W in general. No, I really do. Oh, okay. <laughs> You've definitely got the meme backwards in that situation. That's fair. Okay, more Draconid operatives, talking of memes. Or Deathwing Dragonlord. This is what I'm talking about, though. Like, How many more cards do you want that replace themselves in your hand right but now? Deathwing Dragonlord makes your Deathwing doesn't have a downside anymore, your other Deathwing. But that the the effect of destroying an entire board is not a downside when you are playing against Jade Druid. Okay. 
I mean, you know, a 12-12 that death rattles into a 12-12 is a cool story to a Jade Druid. They can do that effect with, you know, two one-mana Jade Idols later in the game. Sure, but I think that might just be enough right now. All right. Yeah, you know, the Druid, you can't mess around against Jade Druid for too long. No, nope, it's fair. I, I take your point. Stop that. So it's going to be Innovate uh, Dragon Lord on this turn then, you think? Yeah, I think so. Why not make a 12-12? Sure. Let's go. And if they can deal with it, they've got to deal with another 12-12. It's like just... Yeah, 2-6 Stegodons, except it's 12s. It's like Russian dolls, but Greek and Deathwings. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. And they're the same size instead of changing. Yes. So it's nothing like it at all. Apart from being different in every single way. It's Me exactly like that. Meanwhile, back at the game. Yes. The Jades haven't really got big enough. Whoa! Did you just use my own line against me? May have? Damn. How times have changed. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get your revenge sooner rather than later. But yeah, serious problems here for Portugal because they just... First of all, they've got to challenge a 12-12. And secondly, they've got to do it in such a way that they can actually win the game afterwards. And they don't know about the disaster that may befall them if they do kill it. How big are the... Uh... The Jades right now, by the way. I knew you were going to ask that, and it's 5-5. Five, 5-5, five. Five, five, helpfully just popping up on screen. So it would be 5-5 five, five and 6-6 six, six developed this turn with uh, Spirit and Idol, potentially, which means one thing would be out of range of Dragonfire Potion, and that 1-1 one, one isn't a concern for slamming into it, because that in itself is not a Dragon and would have to trade preemptively before the Dragonfire Potion gets cast. So it oh, is. No, the 12-12 would trade into the 4-8 first if that was a situation. That's true, yeah, he could do it like that. But so they've actually exact taken care trade of it. plays around that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, double Twilight Drake must be tempting, because they're only gonna be four ones if they're pulled into play from the battle from the death battle here. Yes. So it may be tempting to just put those on the board now. Uh, the Jades are just starting to become scary though, so you've got to always bear in mind the race mechanics here as well. How useful is this Dragonfire Potion for the rest of the game though is my question. Maybe one Twilight Drake and then the Dragonfire Potion is the best compromise here because it's fast becoming quite useless, right? As the Jades hit 7-7 seven, seven and 8-8. Eight, right. eight. Yeah, it's not got anything to back it up. I doubt there's a Nova, that's a two turn thing anyway. Exactly. And we've already seen one go. This is actually kind of awkward. I uh, how many taunts are left for Portugal? I think there's a second Behemoth. Second Tar Creeper, which we can see is actually in hand. Uh, but there's sometimes only one. There is sometimes only one. If the uh, the Gluttonous Ooze often goes in that spot, if it is being played, right. which it almost certainly is these days, because you need Medivh answers. Yeah, we've seen that every single time today. Yep. Of course, correct sequencing here. Dragonfire Potion doesn't hit the Twilight Drake, so you should play it first just to get that extra plus one health. Auctioneer Wild Growth, looking beautiful. Everybody's favorite three cards for one. But they're going to take a beating next turn unless this produces some spectacular results. They can just kill the 12-8, but you don't want to. This is the whole problem scary, with this death right? Thing, right? You know there's going to be more dragons. You just don't know what they're going to be. And again, you're talking about teams having spotters. They may, well, they should know that there is a card in the left-hand side that is a dragon that has been there all game. Yes, the Nether Spite Historian number one card is still in hand at the moment. Now it's decision time. Well, that was a solid auction here. Turns out this card is quite good in several decks. Yep. 6-1 clears the 4-6, and Twilight Drake number 2 is now available. Alongside Power Word Shield, Auctioneer will go down. This 12 damage will continue to terrorize. But here's the problem. They haven't really had the opportunity to start pushing. So maybe this is it. Maybe you don't hit the 4-4. Maybe you just silence it to stop it drawing cards. Start jamming 12 to face. Because now there is a, a, a plethora of cards in hand for Portugal, which means they can start to generate a, a board that A, is too big for your AoE yep. to deal with, and B, you've already gone and used it all. So you cannot hang around forever now, especially now you have the chance that that Deathwing is going to get ripped out onto the board without activating Battlecry. Right, and we saw yesterday the damage that can happen straight after a big Auctioneer turn when Tyler turned the game around. That was beautiful, that turn. And yeah, it really was. was. And as you said, it, it was likely that his team had no say in that because it all happened too quickly. Uh, but yeah... The other problem here is that Jade can actually just... Here's a taunt and some 8-8s. Eight and your, your Deathwing's dealing with the taunts and the 8-8s eight are hitting you in the face. And 
Yeah, two turns that the, the taunts function a little bit like ice blocks. Yeah, and uh, just an interesting choice again from Greece, choosing to put the extra health onto the Song Stealer as opposed to on the Dragon Lord, because of course they would love to have this Deathwing Dragon Lord stick around and do 12, but there's no need to protect it with too much care, because if it dies, you're pretty much happy with that. There's a new 12-12 on the board that can still represent lethal. Yeah, and is there actually any way around this that can be realistically me made? Well, they can live. There is no question about the fact that they can stay alive this turn. With the combination of Feral Rage and Earthen Scales and Tark Reaper, they can definitely get the job done. But, as you mentioned, it's not about just staying alive this turn. It's about addressing this board state over the long term so you don't die in two turns instead of one. And Logan's looking comfortable. <laughs> what is happening? Uh, this is how you build a community, though. You get all it's true. Just get comfortable in each other's presence and enjoy yourselves, and yep. the rest follows on from that. Enjoying yourself. Is that what I've been doing wrong this whole time? That's what you've been doing wrong today. <laughs> Definitely far less of that from you. We won't recognize you for long. Jeez. But yeah, it's starting to look very much like a bad 80s movie. Look at this priest abuse, by the way. Innovate Aya. You cannot do two damage, is what you are saying to your priest opponent. And you know what? Most of the time, you are damn right. They cannot do two damage. Yeah, and that's a thing that has just been going on for priest as long as the thing has been a game. As long as the game has priest thing. Words are good at this point. I'm just going to pretend I said something there. <laughs> you don't have to pretend. You definitely did say something. It happened. I was there. I witnessed it. But they are setting up the win now. The Tar Creeper may delay that just a little bit longer. Well, they can uh, heal for how much? 17 this turn, if they <laughs> would like to? Seems a lot. It's a big number. It is, and 25 health for the priest seems like a big number, but it's only like three golems worth of face. And how much longer can you hang around in this game before you have to panic and realize that you have to clear this board with that Deathwing before your Dragon Lord Death Rattle pulls it out? Yeah, and I think at this point that Ginger knows that it's Deathwing as well. There are very, very few cards that wouldn't have been played by now that have been a dragon from turn Esera two. Sarah would have been played more than likely. Yeah, uh, even Nozdoma just for an 8-8. I think all those cards may have been played by now. Right. So maybe they've actually worked out that this is Deathwing. It's possible. And they also may work out that even if it isn't guaranteed Deathwing, that they can only beat Deathwing. It may be that they say, well, if it's such and such another card, we just don't care. I think they do a pretty Deathwing. good job of beating most other cards in this position. So. I, think, I think Deathwing is potentially the one that might still beat them. And they're going to gain that whole chunk of armor and start hitting some face. And this is roughly how Tyler did it yesterday. And what did I say about the situation you want to be in where you're trying to Deathwing a board that specifically does not have Ayer on it? Yeah, and they're... Portugal have managed to set up the exact opposite. They put the eye there, kept it alive, hidden it behind a taunt. And going to be interesting that it will be a 9-9, nine -nine, I believe. I wonder. Confused by the fact there's two 8-8s eight on the board. Inside well, the eye, inside been, but... the eye is a 9-9 nine -nine. Right. Yes, right now. Yeah, the next Jade is a 9-9. Nine -nine. But what wins that race? The Deathwing on its own or the Druid with a 9-9 nine -nine and a Nourish? Worming the 3 5. Is this trade or face? Uh, they're facing 21, and they can heal up to 22. They, they would be they, dead yeah, if they, they don't have trade. To trade. I just don't see the long term game plan here anymore. Because if, if they're trading, then the Deathwing is hitting the board as a brand new 12 12 without activating the Death Row. Okay, healing up the minion to trade first, keep it alive. I think they are just trying to, you know, play the bluff game here. I think the plans have oh. changed. And they are looking to play Deathwing as a minion from hand here and activate the battle cry. Yeah, with the stipulation there is no longer going to be an Aya, maybe. Yes. Although Jay Behemoth makes that really, really messy yet again. Because they've got no way of killing a 3-6 without using their Deathwing as it stands at the moment. If they use their Death so without using the Deathwing Dragon Lord on the table. Which means right. that the Deathwing yes. in right. hand then would come into play and not do the thing that you want it to do. Mm-hmm. Such an interesting game. You know, I, I question this choice to go for the, the Dragon Lord into Deathwing plan. 
after they discovered the, the, the second Deathwing, the Deathwing Dragonlord off the second Nether Spire historian. I questioned how much you might want to rely on Deathwing's Battlecry to actually push through. Yeah, I, I, no question that you know in a different world, Greece's plan definitely could have got there. They've only been a couple yeah. of points away on a couple of turns here, and Portugal have had an insane auctioneer turn to back this up that could have made all the difference, but it, it might end up just being one bridge too far for them here with the Deathwing. Trying to work out if there's any actual way where they can survive here. Let's see what the card is going to be before we try to do that. Radiant Elemental number two, not good enough. Shadow of Pain would have been a pickup. I know, I think we've seen two get used, but one of them was from the that early Shadow Visions. That was the pickup then, so I think there is a third copy left remaining in the deck, which could have potentially got some work done, but I'm not seeing too promising a way out of this because even Deathwing now, there is a 10-10 left on the board afterwards. Let's see how... They just can't do anything as far as I can see. No, not seeing it. Not even a spell to go with the Priest. There's no trades. They're just going to be one short. That behemoth being a massive pickup last turn, basically. Uh, they can get to eight and trade it as it stands, but they'll be one short. They'll have to leave up the nine nine and the ten ten. That's that's more than one short. That's like eleven. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's close to one. It's, it's, it's got not, ones in it's, it. It's a large number away. Yes. Looks like we're going to an ace match. This series living up to expectations. We called it out as one of the big ones for the day, and it's living up to the hype so far. These two teams seeming very evenly matched so far. Yeah, I'm not even sure what the play here is. I think they're just going to make sure that everything gets played, that they've added it upright. They have. Maybe Aya doesn't spawn a minion. It does. <laughs> He'd still be dead, even if Aya didn't spawn a minion. <laughs> Aya would have need to spawn a Doomsayer. Fine, yes. I know cards that used to do that. It, it has happened. It's been points. known. Yes. There you go. Portugal still believes. Sareza hyping up his boys here. Sareza, another player that I've got to meet and hang out with. I feel like all of these players on these two teams are just close personal friends of mine. But again, awesome. he, he made an HCT trip of his own. So another player that I've uh, got to know a little bit about. And he is a very passionate player in his own right. And uh, you saw it all come out there at the end as that was a long, hard-fought victory and the real break point was that decision to depart from the Deathwing as a board clear plan and move towards Deathwing as just an auxiliary 12-12 plan right. to try and dominate the board. And amazingly, 12-12 into 12-12 just wasn't good enough. There were a lot of taunts in a row for Portugal, in fairness. Like you say, in another world, that, that plan may have worked. You need to play out a lot of times. Just looking at the final matchup here. I was wondering what the hell just happened. It's a hunter mirror. It is a hunter mirror. For all of the biscuits. All of the marbles. Every last one of them. <laughs> hunter versus hunter. Ignite versus death -alore. It's going to happen. It's coming down to it. These, this is a repeat matchup of what we saw just through coincidence. These two played each other the way it lined up there. You see on the, the, the death -alore picking up the win with the warrior over the rogue, pirate warrior versus quest rogue. And now they're gonna come back down to it with a hunter mirror. And Raven asked me earlier, hey, how does this matchup go of uh, aggro murloc paladin versus hunter? My answer was turn one. Yeah. If that is true of any matchup now, it is this one right here. Yeah, uh, I think that we used to discuss at this point, which is the faster hunter, which is this, which is that. Now we discuss who goes first. Yes. If you go turn one alicat, turn two scavenging hyena, you, you win. It's unfortunate, but that's the way this particular matchup sets up, that if you go first and your hand isn't awful, you tend to do well, and you do have one or two unbeatable starts. So a lot of it is down to who goes first, but if the game gets to turn four, turn five, a bit like the old Druid, combo Druid matches, when nobody gets the ridiculous that's good, start, that's, good, that's a good comparison. It, yeah, it becomes think. really, really skillful at that point. Yes, I completely agree. And uh, there are there is some counterplay to, you know, to going first, turn one, Alley Cat, if you have a uh, coin grandmother, sometimes that can get you out of that situation. Yeah. You can bounce back, just get enough tempo back just about. Because you present a world where scavenging hyena and double trade isn't good. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you just still have a 3-2 in play. Yes, they, they make a, uh, what would it be, 6-4 at that point. But, you know, you still are relatively competitive. It's also a world where Crackling Razormore isn't very good because, you know, what buffs really effectively right. trade two one ones into a 1-1 and a 3-2. So there is opportunities to come back. Um, Unleash the Hounds can be a swing turn as well, again, if paired with Direwolf Alpha or Scavenging Hyena in later turns. But those are all the exceptions to the rule. The rule is that going first with a one drop is king in this matchup.
Talking of King, I wonder if we will see the King in any of these decks. We've seen him yeah, three or four time. times yeah. today. Swamp King Dread, of course. He's <laughs> really good against Tundra Rhino, by the way. We even saw him show up in a non-hunter game, whereas uh, I can't really think of any seven <laughs> drops that would be particularly insane right now. Oh, there's one, Swamp King Dread. Yeah, and I understood entirely what you're saying about the, it. Would it has to be a downside? That's how the game works. If he's overstatted, yes, the ability is a downside. But he definitely has some uses. Oh, for sure. Uh, that I think people will look into more and more in terms of busting combos. And Reese have have won the toss. They're going to go first, but their hand isn't particularly abusive in any way. Abusive it is not. They might just have to keep McCaw here and just say, hey, it's a one drop. Right. Um, you know, it's not the dream. It's not an alley cat. It's not even a fiery bat. It's not even a firefly, as you see that Portugal are playing here. And here's a mark of how good firefly is as a card. Hunter had the selection of every one mana beast under the sun that they could be playing in this spot. And many of them are now choosing to include Firefly in one of those slots instead. And it was Zires who started off this trend to some extent earlier as well. So. I'm not quite so sure about that. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you he he was the first person to really come out with a list that was very successful and well publicized, but there was definitely a few players messing around with it before. I think that. he was the first one to really take the stance and say, look, this card is this a is card right. yeah. that is right yeah. because. I uh, that, that's a fair statement. Okay, sure. I don't want to credit the wrong people for things. Anyway, Ignite here is another player who is really, really tasty when it comes to playing slightly unusual setups. Uh, we've seen him again, you mentioned it, in some new events where he's just turned up with Shaman, I believe it was, and rocked through the Swiss with that one time. Yes. When nobody was... This was before... He was like, yeah, of course you rock up with Shaman. No, this, <laughs> this, is, this is before Shaman was Shaman. This is when Shaman was like just some sort of thing that yeah, there's, didn't there's, talk about. There's some newer players who heard that statement and went, what the, what, <laughs> What's this guy on about? Shaman, yeah, big whoop, well done. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Firefly versus Firefly standoff, and Greece's hand has improved incredibly from that opening mulligan. It has, and now you see exactly the power of going first here. One of these players gets to snowball, the other one does not. Direwolf Alpha here breaks this tie enormously in the favor of Greece in this position. So Ignite's going to have to find a way after after the dust settles to get the most out of this Unleash the Hound. That's his big equalizing chance that may come up. Uh, but he's not going to. He's going to be the one that's facing a houndmastered minion of some sort on turn four. Yeah, there's also there is a consideration, which is probably what the discussion was about. There of um, there was no coin on turn one, which is quite often what the player going second tries to do, kind of desperately scrambles to try and compete with the board on right. turn one. Since there wasn't a coin, you're reading three mana plays. Those three mana plays can be animal companion. So there's a consideration from Greece of saying, hey, do we play all our one drops this turn? Then do we use Direwolf to try and put punch through a animal companion right. on the following turn. It just so works out that this play with the Dire Wolf just puts enough power to compete with even Misha into play anyway, so you might as well just go ahead and drop this. Just looking at this Snapjaw, it's not the worst minion in this spot. It's, it's something that can stick around, which is what you really, really need. You still need a Houndmaster to go with it at some true. point, but it's something they can dump on the board that says, hey, you've got to kill me because you can't have this Houndmastered. Animal. Depending exactly how the snowball's going. Right. Animal Companion, though, going to curve very nicely into Houndmaster here. The board position is already in favor of Greece before they even play this Animal Companion. So you can see how quickly this has snowballed from the one drop into Direwolf Alpha. And that's exactly what we were talking about when we talked about going first. The trades could have already happened. 2-1 into the 1-2, 2-2 into the 1-1, and he was already still ahead. He gets to add an entire brand new Misha to that. Just not messing around, trading a 3-1 into a 1-1 one, one here to make sure there is no accidents going to happen with Houndmasters or with uh, Razor Mords, anything like that. Just keep everything off the board. Yep, Razor Moor, Kill Command, Scavenging Hyena, uh, Houndmaster. Pretty much every card under the sun can punish you for leaving a beast up and... It's Hunter, I mean, yes, it's still very aggressive. You know, that big that big green circle with a glowing arrow that punches you in the face for two has a lot to do with it. Right. It's always going to be an aggressive class. However, with Quickshot losing the game, Hunter actually can't really burst you from hand anymore. They have two cards, Kill Command, that can do that, and Eagle yep. Hornbow sometimes. 
So you need to build and protect board presence. It's actually a much more tempo-y, snowball-y based deck than it ever used to be. And I feel there that Portugal were going for the huffer roll there. That's how desperate I think they were. I think they decided not, it's not just development, but let's just make a chance at huffer here. Yeah. There were other plays that are possibly slightly better development-wise, like the bow or even the snap jaw, but the answer is let's just get huffer. Because otherwise, this happens. Exactly this happens, yep. And that Dire Wolf that came down on turn two is still sticking around. The Kill Command pickup is not really good enough to deal with the big problems here. And yeah, it's looking like this game is going as expected and Death Lore is going to try and ride this through. The one saving grace maybe now for Portugal in this spot is look at the hand for Death Lore. Not much going on in the way of value unless the Macaw can pick up something spectacular. So if Portugal can <laughs> just get these cards in hand used, survive for two or three more turns, maybe they find a resource advantage because that Unleash the Hounds is a huge whiff as well. Yeah, I just giggling there in the background while you were going through all that uh, death lore. He's telling the team, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And they're just laughing. They're like, well, we know you've got this in underhand. He's going back to what we were told by Boris about death lore being a little bit anxious. He's going through everything carefully. He's making sure that no mistakes are made. And the rest of the team are like, eh, we got this, we're good. <laughs> Trying to put him at ease. And it's very interesting to watch the dynamic in the Greek team. I'm really impressed with what we've seen with them all today so far, having a lot of fun with it and playing very well. Is it quite that simple, though? Because they haven't pushed huge amounts of damage because right. of all that trading that I was talking about, just protecting their board lead. Unleash the Hound's coin kill command is available next turn, which, as far as I can see, more or less takes care of any possible board state that Greece can develop right. this turn. And then, then it's down to high main versus, at best, Stranglethorn Tiger from the opponent. And high main does better than Stranglethorn in that particular encounter. And like you say, 18 health is just about enough to have a chance of stabilizing. Uh, that's nine hero powers away, that's too many. There is a kill command in the hand for Greece, so that's 13. There is an Unleashed Hound, that will get one or two damage through, that's 12, 11, couple of hero powers. Nine, seven. They've got to find five or six or seven damage from somewhere. <laughs> this episode of Counting with Lorinda. Counting backwards, you. please. By by the letter H. <laughs> the letters H. No, <laughs> that's no, not no, a letter. It is indeed not a letter. <laughs> okay. And there'll be an ongoing fight between myself, you, Gaskin, and Raven over that over the coming weeks, I'm sure. Oh, does Gaskin say H? As he well? says a H. Unlucky. <laughs> Yes, indeedy. Luckily, it, though, we're in Group B, so it doesn't matter. And this is Group D, so it still doesn't matter. It's got to be Unleashed, right? It just it just looks right to say, hey, you didn't have a great turn there. Okay, here's what's going on, is that Ignite is trying to find a line of play that beats first high main from the opponent. Right. That's the situation he's scared of. He hasn't found that, so now he's going to say, okay, I'm going to take the board clear plan, and if you don't have first high main, then I get to play first high main, and then we're potentially back in business. Yeah, unfortunately for him, this Stranglethorn Tiger, I was saying it wins, it loses the battle against high main, but it doesn't lose the battle against face when your opponent is on 17. This is very true. Uh, the Rhino is an interesting pickup here because it allows, they've just seen a struggled clear. Um, it allows the Rhino to go face with the cats and just punch some damage and say, can you deal with it? I think you still just play the Tiger. Yeah. Because it looks like an inevitable win if you do. Yes. They will be considering the implications first and foremost of a deadly shot here, I imagine. Right. They won't, probably won't want to get this Stranglethorn Tiger deadly shotted, whereas if the Rhino were to get deadly shot, at least they push two with it and then two more because they can play the Alley Cat at the same time yep. and charge in two more damage. So that's one way they can play around one of their opponent's possible outs that they might be considering. And then, hey, if the Tundra Rhino sticks, then playing the Rhino next turn is the, just the same damn thing as playing it this turn. Right. It pushes five damage on the same turn. Uh, they also will be factoring in, if all that happens, if there is a deadly shot, it still buys a bit of time. Next turn, then, they, they open up their hero power into Rhino, for instance. So that's an extra two damage. Right. Just by the fact the game hasn't ended favours Greece as well now. So Ignite re-evaluates. Re he did not see the first high main that he was going to be scared of, but Stranglethorn Tiger is more or less good enough in this spot. And he is just going to play his own high main onto this board, but there is so much initiative coming back at him. Kitty gets in for five, other Kitty gets in for one, and the cutest Kitty of them all gets in for one more. That is seven, hero power is nine, kill command is 14. Unleash only adds one, though. 
Tune in next week for Counting with Sottle now, as I've obviously been replaced in the counting role. Yes. But yeah, at this point, they just count how many hero powers do we need. The answer is two. The answer is not very many. How, how many turns are they going to kill us in? The answer is more than two. So you just go for the line where you win with the hero power. Yep. And with the kill command in hand, it's not even those two, really. It's just this one this turn, and then the next one is going to wrap up the game alongside the kill command. Right, but when you say he needs to, oh, okay, it's like sure. you need to find two turns to oh, hero okay, power sure. twice. Yeah, the way I, I worded it badly. I was looking at he needs two hero oh, powers right. there. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. Greece get their first win of the event. And much to their relief, obviously Portugal losing that one, but they're still going to be in an okay position, I believe. Yeah, I mean, not looking too bad, but that Hunter game came right the way down to exactly what we talked about. It was just snowball from turn one. One drop landed from both sides. The tie was broken by the player who had the initiative to play the Direwolf Alpha, and the board was just never relinquished. That's not to say there weren't mistakes that could have been made right. to throw that away. You saw, what was it, turn five, turn six, uh, the Portuguese hunter was still sitting at 27, 28 life. There were yep. no face attacks going through. It was just board control, board control, board control from Greece, and that was the reason why they were able to just force through all the damage they needed in one or two turns at the end there. And there is the tail of the tape. Dr. Boom, everybody's favorite wild card that apparently doesn't get played in wild very much, taking the lead there. But then Deathlord Sibu getting the job done to get a 2-1 lead. Portugal coming back to 2 all with the ever-confident Ginger, but in that battle of hunters at the end there, Deathlord finishing off the game and taking 3-2, keeping Greece in a good position, well not a good position, but in a position that would have been very, very terminal if they didn't win today. Yeah, and you've, you've mentioned several times that, uh, like Abals mentioned, that Deathlord did struggle just a little bit with nerves in his opinion, so him uh, being trusted there with the ace match and being able to clutch it out for the team, I'm sure will be a great feeling for him, very reassuring feeling for him, and a great win all around for Greece, and a much needed one at that. And we're going to have some happy news for Sotter, we're going to get to talk now to Like a Boss. Hey buddy, how's it going, man? We can't, we can't hear you. Can we hear you? We can't hear you. Can you hear us? Give it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to conduct this interview through the medium of sign language? Because <laughs> <laughs> we can't hear you, but that's fantastic anyway. Uh, give us a sign that indicates how you feel about your performance in this matchup. Yo. It's a family show. All right, your your team as a whole, Greece's as a whole performance as this matchup. He's given up on us, Linda. No, <laughs> <laughs> I was looking forward to this. No, well, yeah, we we we're not. Hey, now. hey, there we go. Okay, I fixed it. <laughs> nice. Good job. So, yeah, overall, must feel great to uh, get a win on the board for Greece. I don't know if you've heard, but every time we go through the uh, the league tables in the intro, I say that Greece are just way too good to be sitting at 0-2. So it must be feeling to, to get a, it must be a great feeling to get a win on the board. I know, I know. But it was, uh, yeah, I love the Portugal guys, but uh, based on the Euro 2004, it was easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, nicely done. I think both sides had a few uh, choice words coming into this one about how uh, how confident they were, how easy it was going to be. One of the two teams managed to back that up. So how do you feel that it was you? Yeah, awesome. At last we won. <laughs> it was about time, man. <laughs> so do you feel now that you'll be able to finish it all off and get through this group and into the next stage? Um, sure. If we... If we have some good draws and we have the curve and everything and we practice more because we don't <laughs> practice at all, we just play Heroes of the Storm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hey, so at, at least we'll it's a Blizzard it. game, right? Like, there you go. Yeah, just keep yeah. outdooring face, you'll be absolutely fine, yeah. I'm it, sure. Yeah, but it has less RNG. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> ah, thanks, buddy. A pleasure as always. I'm sure we will speak again at some point, but we'll let you go and celebrate your victory, as I'm sure you are dying to do. Congrats, guys. Okay, thank you, guys. <laughs> did I mention that Like a Boss is a troll? Yes, yes you did. Okay, right. That was that obviously that what he was going to say at some yeah. point there. Yeah. And so we're going to get the groups up on the screen. Let's have a look at exactly where they all stand. 
And there you go. We're looking for them, but yeah, we forgot they've won, but they're still down the bottom a little bit there. One and two, Portugal one and one, and this group is still wide open. It is. Yeah, I mean, uh, there can definitely be a few favours from the other countries towards Greece if they all start to pick up a few wins off each other now and just compress this group together. Slovakia and Hungary were going to you know, have matchups against Hong Kong, for example, if it's going to work out like that way in the future. That those wins going to Hong Kong can really compress the group in Greece's favor and allow them to make a push from here. Yeah, South Korea, one of the big names in that group. One and one, how they do will probably massively influence the how the second and third places pan out. Yep, it's a very good point, but from the Greek perspective, they'll be happy to be on the board. Portugal were definitely the country there that could afford a loss in that game. Yes. Greece definitely could not. And as we look back through one or two of the highlights here, starting off with the Taunt Warrior game where there was just no value getting drawn from the uh, from the Greek team from Leica Bals, and he just was not able to get any pressure down after the first two initial board clears came down from Portugal. He was just picking up more small Murlocs, equalities, consecrations, never quite finding the value. Finally hit a Ragnaros Light Lord very deep into the game, but it just was not good enough to get the job done. Right, and right at the very start, it did look like they were just going to be able to force the Murloc advantage through because we assumed they're going to draw into more mid game, and it just never happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, going there with the crab right at the end. And you know, it wasn't far off. As you see, this second equality consecration going through, they were able to keep pushing through damage and they got, got the, the warrior down to fairly low, but it was just one Tarim, one Tyrion away from maybe getting the job done and a Stonehill defender was pulled out by a dirty rat, preventing any of that nonsense happening. Portugal here in this game with their Black Knight tech that never got used and they took a chance here that the second Savage Roar wasn't in hand. We explained why at the time. There were good reasons, I believe, for them to think that. I think it was a fair enough call. Keep the removal for the Living Manor. Right. Uh, the call is one of those that when you get it wrong looks really silly, but actually I suspect it was quite sensible. It does. I, I would still like to bring up the debate of how you plan to beat that board over the next couple of turns if, you, if you're not going to Lightning Storm it. Um, but there is sure, certainly that consideration of a Living Mana coming down. Um, but yeah, this was the big divergent point in this matchup where we said, OK, I'm going to take a Deathwing Dragon Lord. I'm going to give up on Deathwing coming down as a battle cry and destroying these huge Jade boards. I'm just going to try this to win this game with the world's biggest piloted shredder, 12-12 death rattling into a 12-12. And in fairness, it looked for a while like that might work, but a few taunt minions and that suddenly changed it around. And this game, a little bit of an anti-climax here, Hunter sure. versus Hunter. For such a great matchup, two of the best teams in this group, mm -hmm. uh, we do end up with the Hunter versus Hunter, which is sometimes a bit of a shame, and they got a decent start and that was pretty much the end of that. It was and uh, just enough damage being forced through at the end as we had a minor quibble over what needing two hero powers meant but in the end what it meant to Greece was victory. The first victory on the board as you see the world's most casually cool handshake and between Deathlaw and his partner there. Yeah, and you decided to um, finally disagree with something at the end there after agreeing all cast. That is the fifth match. That usually signals the end of the day. But today it doesn't signal the end of the day. We've got what I think most people will consider the big one. Romania, who have yet to win, versus the USA, who have yet to lose. We'll have that for you in a couple of moments. We're almost there. Quiet down, everyone. This is not like any of our previous expeditions. This will be far more ambitious. We're stepping into a land of primordial wonder. Infused with astonishing elemental energies. Plant life here holds very unusual properties. So don't touch anything. And while you may be excited to see the local fauna, you might want to make sure they don't see you. Because their powers of adaptation are devastating. Make no mistake, we will be tested at every turn. But if 
we stay on our guard, we might just survive. Now then, are you ready? Then let's journey into Ongoro Crater. Yeah.